for those who were here in the morning session, this is part two, and it goes along with what I presented already, although I'll summarize a couple of key points. There we go. So uh, I alluded to this this morning in the earlier session, but there are some unanswered questions about chromoendoscopy. First, does it really change outcomes in our patients, and specifically which outcomes? Uh, who really needs it and who doesn't? How do you measure quality of chromoendoscopy? What's the best way to learn this technique? And is chromo still going to be needed with our newer high definition scopes, especially with the, the new high definition NBI? Uh, and that's not answered yet as well. So there's a lot of unanswered questions. And I wanted to present that to you before I show you chromo so that you understand that my message today is not that you should all go home and do this in all your patients, but rather we should select specific patients in whom we believe this can be beneficial and understand who those might be. Uh, in addition, uh, there's a question that's been raised as uh, to whether chromo could be performed in patients who have active inflammation. In general, the quality of the imaging and the dye uh, uptake is quite limited in those situations. So it's not for everybody. Maybe we should be applying it to the higher risk patients so that we can find lesions and make sure those are under careful surveillance. The PSC patient, the patient with prior dysplasia, long-standing pancolitis with prior severe inflammation, meaning escalation of therapies or previous hospitalization, active inflammation every time you look. Uh, and the other area we can certainly use it in is for lesion-specific assessment, like patients who have a lesion and you want to try to highlight the margins to do an endoscopic mucosal resection or have a better sense of whether or not there are satellite lesions around some of what we see in our colitis patients. There's been proposal that we use something called the surface guidelines for chromo, which includes strict patient selection, unmasking the mucosal surface, reducing peristaltic waves, which may occur just with the opioid that you use during your conscious sedation, but sometimes people have used glucagon full staining length of the colon, augmented detection with dye, and I'll talk more about that, crypt architecture analysis, and I'll show you examples, and endoscopic targeted biopsies, especially for pit patterns three and four. So you might want to know what the pit patterns that we're talking about are, and this is the CUDO classification from as far back as 1993, uh, in which we have the non-neoplastic patterns on the left and those neoplastic patterns on the right characterizing, um, and you can see how non-neoplastic 1 might look a little like 3S in initial glance, uh, but the more curvilinear and cerebriform appearances of the uh, mucosa and the crypt patterns become important. And in my presentation, I'm going to give you examples of all of those. My approach to chromo is that I use the higher risk patients and patients who are sent to me who've had prior dysplasia, as well as I use it for segmental lesion identification and clarification. I do try to get patients in uh, as clean and as well prepped as possible. I prefer a drier prep, so despite the fact that we're all using um, phospho soda preps much less often or not at all, I do have some younger patients in whom I choose that prep intentionally and I use the tablet form. Um, but not everybody, but you just want to make sure they're as clean as possible and you do a lot of uh, suctioning on the way in to get rid of excess fluid so that on the way out when you're doing your dye spray it doesn't get diluted further and confuse you. I do prefer methylene blue despite what I said briefly uh, before about some of the concerns people have raised about it. I don't think that mucosal dye spray with methylene blue has any significant drug interaction in your patient on SSRIs and I do not believe that the amount that we use um, is significant in terms of raising the risk of neoplasia. Uh, I use a standard scope with power wash, as you're going to see. I do segmental exam as I come back from the cecum, uh, and I look for raised lesions and abnormal microscopic and pit patterns. And I'm the first to say that despite any attempt to do so, I know I'm not seeing the entire colonic mucosa. The surface area is about uh, 1,500 centimeters squared, and I sh I'm sure I'm not seeing everything, but you do the best you can. Uh, I usually take a 500 cc irrigation bottle of uh, sterile fluid. I have the nurse empty out half of it, and they prepare it by putting two of these 10 milligram per ml methylene blue uh, bottles in there. When I use indigo carmine, I actually use three of theirs because I find that the dye is more uh, is not as uh, concentrated and it's harder to use. So I use three when I do indigo carmine. Uh, we learned early on to do it next to the sink. 
um, and we used the power wash. And uh, on the way in, we used just the standard power wash hooked up to my irrigation fluid. And when I get to the cecum and I've done my job all the way uh, on the way in, then the nurse uh, or the assistant and technician will switch it out with the bottle that's pre-made pre with the chromo before we started the exam. One trick is to know where gravity is so that you can spray at the top of the colon, which is in this picture intentionally meant to be the top of the screen, but as you know, when you're inside somebody's colon, it might be to the right or left. The idea then is you use less dye and it then drips down using gravity. And because that methylene blue is an absorptive dye, it gets absorbed into the cytoplasm of the cells and brought up really nicely. So let's see if all this uh, technology works. Here's um, methylene blue spraying. You see the power wash going right on there, and now you can actually see that pit pattern appearing and I took a still picture of it, so you got a nice image of those uh, curvilinear appearances. That was a low-grade dysplastic lesion that I removed by EMR. Here's what indigo carmine looks in contrast. I want you to specifically notice, I'm not here to diss indigo carmine, but the reality is you can see it sort of puddles around. It doesn't give you that rich staining despite my efforts to spray it. This is why you have the patient roll, and for those who are looking carefully, you're also probably seeing that lesion right there that lit up. Um, which is uh, identifiable because of the indigo carmine. Uh, and that lesion actually had the pit pattern of a 3S when you got a little bit closer to it and a little bit of a 3L there. This was a low-grade dysplastic lesion right on a fold. So the dye clearly highlighted that for you. You can imagine how easily we might have missed that as we came by in this patient. And then I actually did uh, polypectomy with a snare there. Uh, this is a patient who uh, has a history of Crohn's colitis in remission, a second degree family member with, adult, with older onset colon cancer, and you can see the pseudopolyp appearance there. I turned on NBI just to give you the image that you all see when you flip it on. You can imagine how it might be impossible to tell that this is uh, somebody who has a sporadic low-grade uh, dysplastic adenoma. Um, in the field of colitis, because uh, you can't. The reality is it's hard. You can look as carefully as possible. Uh, and the reality is I don't think you need chromo to find these lesions, of course. And you can argue whether or not chromo would help you identify anything specific hidden in the middle of these lesions. And if you were here for the Q&A from the last session, you know that uh, when you have a field of pseudopolyps, it is hard to know what you're looking for and see them all. So you really have to be careful and have that discussion with your patient. 38-year-old with Crohn's ileal pancolitis, and this lesion was in the sigmoid colon found on white light. You can see that there, it looks like there's deep remission here, but clearly some distortion of the mucosa consistent with chronic colitis. Polyp was removed by snare cautery, and it was low-grade dysplasia in a polyp. The way the pathologist read it out was polypoid low-grade dysplasia. I did not use the term adenoma, which we associate with the sporadic type lesions. It could have been a sporadic adenoma in the setting of colitis, uh, of Crohn's colitis as a coincidence, but the reality is we can't tell. And until we have better markers to know if that makes a difference, we really can't call it that. Different patient, 71-year-old man with indeterminate extensive colitis for 10 years in clinical remission. This lesion is seen in the sigmoid colon. I hope you can appreciate it up here on the left. There it is, right? And that's seen with narrow band imaging. Uh, and you might be asking now, well, why can't we just use narrow band imaging? Um, the lesion was unresectable with high grade and had high grade dysplasia, and therefore this patient went to surgery and had um, proctocolectomy. So the answer to the question about why not just use narrow band imaging is that at least with the uh, previous generation of scopes and not fully tested with high def yet, there have been three studies that compared narrow band to white light in the colitis population, and they were not significantly uh, better with narrow band. Now, having said that, you can see that I use narrow band to help me out uh, all the time, and I don't want you to think it's a substitute for chromo in the patients in whom may uh, benefit from chromo but you should at least know what the evidence shows you and how small some of the studies are that try to look at these things. Now here's a patient with a lesion that you can see with white light there, I think, but with uh, methylene blue, look at how nicely the margins are, are brought out. I did an endoscopic mucosal resection on this patient, and then uh, just because the lesion, when I removed it, was a little deeper than I'm usually comfortable with, I used a couple clips. Um, I'm not here to advocate for that, but I felt more comfortable about it. It's probably more for me than for him. This is a 62-year-old man with ulcerative colitis for more than 20 years with this focal polypoid lesion that you can see on white light there, right? But when we use the methylene blue, you can now see how the margins come out. And very importantly, I hope you can appreciate some of this, there was some satellite lesions over here that I didn't quite appreciate as well 
in the white light image. So there's clearly a role for this. When you find a lesion, you should think about enhancing it if you're gonna try to remove it. Uh, and certainly when you use chromo, you can find these things uh, more easily. If you look at the pit pattern, you can get a better sense of what this was. This was low-grade dysplasia. For those who can see it, I'll point out for you that those uh, curvilinear appearances of the, of the um, crypts there and the folds uh, compared to this area here where you just have more of the oval or circular pattern. This was endoscopically unresectable despite our attempts and we sent the patient to surgery. Here's a 36-year-old woman with extensive UC for 15 years in remission on 5-ASA and this is the lesion seen in the rectum with methylene blue. This is the pit pattern that's most consistent with a type one. I did biopsy it, although when you get better, oops, sorry, when you get better at this, you can appreciate how you might not need to biopsy everything, and this was, in fact, hyperplasia. Here's a 35-year-old man who was sent to me from a referring doctor with longstanding Crohn's colitis who presented with this lesion in the distal rectum. So here it is on white light. Maybe you can see um, something there. Here's with narrowband imaging. And here is with methylene blue. So what we're focused on here are some of these uh, raised areas here, multifocal, irregular shaped sort of badness, right? Um, and because of its location and because of the implication that he would need a permanent ileostomy, we did try to do EMR on him, which was done in a piecemeal fashion uh, in standard approach, as you can see here. In three month follow-up, Oh, sorry, let me tell you the path. The path was that it was polypoid, low-grade, and high-grade dysplasia. And so there was a discussion at that point to send him for surgery. Um, his wife was actually quite ill, and they had two kids, and there was a complicated social issue here as part of this. So we agreed that we had done what we could, and we would bring him back and see what else we could find. On follow-up, here's the follow-up. Three months later, you can see the scar tissue on white light, narrow band, and here it is on methylene blue. Um, but I biopsied the rectum where I didn't see anything proximal to this area, and there was confirmed low-grade dysplasia in another part of his rectum. So now we had high-grade dysplasia and low-grade dysplasia, and low-grade dysplasia I couldn't find uh, or see despite using chromo. So I did send him to surgery. How about this? Proctocolectomy reveals no dysplasia. So how do you talk to patients about this? This does happen. I bet some of you in the room are nodding because it's happened to you. Um, I tell patients before they go to surgery that the outcome we want is to be told there's no more dysplasia or cancer, and that we're expecting and hoping that would be what we find, and the reason we're doing all this is to protect them not only from what might still be there, but also what might happen in the future. And thankfully, he's been very healthy since then, and his wife also, for different reasons, is very healthy now, thankfully. This is a, another video um, of methylene blue, and I wanted just to show you what happens when the prep isn't so good. So I'm using the power wash with the methylene blue here to clean it up as much as I can to get rid of some of that exudate that uh, Doug nicely told us isn't called mucopus anymore. And um, you can appreciate uh, some of what we're dealing with here and how it really limits your ability to do a good chromo exam because then everything, all that stuff that's on the mucosa um, preferentially takes up your dye and can confuse you and you can't really see those pit patterns. You can certainly still find some raised lesions. There's also another clue that I'll come to, but when you have adherent uh, exudate uh, or mucus, you should also be willing to think that there may be a dysplastic lesion under those areas of adherent mucus. So look carefully when you have that, especially after you've done your initial wash. If something's still sticking, go there and look carefully at that specific area. This is the same patient in follow-up. There were two um, lesions I identified after cleaning that all up. Here's me removing the second lesion now with a snare cautery. 58-year-old female with a personal history of colonic polyps and ulcerative pancolitis who underwent high-risk colon cancer surveillance with the colonoscopy. I'm just here to show you that you do a careful white light exam, and whenever I'm doing these exams, because surgery may be one of the expected outcomes or plans, I always also carefully assess the ileum, as you see me doing here. And whenever there's confusion or any doubt at all about the diagnosis, I also um, routinely now um, use my biopsy forceps to take a nice picture of the ileocecal valve. Um, and we uh, document that in case there's a question, was this backwash ileitis? Is the valve actually a little fibrotic? And should we be thinking this might have been a Crohn's colitis or something that will behave like Crohn's when they get a J pouch if that comes up? And I document as well the peri appendiceal area. Same patient now with methylene blue on the way out. You can see this lesion here. You might wonder what that might be. Um, it was in the ascending colon. The pit pattern was really not neoplastic. It almost looked exactly like the the pit pattern that was adjacent to it and mucosa that looked pretty 
benign, and in fact, that's what it was. It was uh, just a pseudo polyp. Uh, likewise, here's another lesion that you can see with the methylene blue. You can appreciate how deep the staining is and how rich these images might be. Um, same thing, this was another sort of inflammatory polyp without any significant concerns. But here was another lesion that came, uh, that we found in the transverse colon. You can see, number one, that it's larger than those other two lesions. But I want you to focus also on the pit pattern here um, and where you start to see some of those dysplastic changes that I pointed out to you. And that this, in fact, was a low-grade dysplasia. Uh, and it was arising in the background of colonic mucosa with some distortion consistent with a colitis-associated dysplastic lesion. We were able to remove it completely during that exam, and the patient had active surveillance in follow-up. A 52-year-old woman with Crohn's and previously identified unifocal low-grade dysplasia in the rectum on two sequential exams had um, this on the finding of her rectum. Now, this is bad. And one of the things I wanted to show you was that in the rectum, um, uh, you can see dilated crypts as a normal variant of the rectum. That can confuse you when you're looking at all these things. But this is not what you want to see. Um, there was a lot of uh, distortion, uh, distorted glands, and changes. And this was extensive flat low-grade dysplasia arising in a background of mildly active IBD. So this um, problem was uh, treated with surgery. A 74-year-old female with Crohn's and recent colonoscopy with polypoid and possibly flat mucosal dysplasia in the hepatic flexure and hepatic uh, and uh, ascending colon underwent a colonoscopy. This area looks fine. Um, we documented the ileum as part of that, but then she had this. And in fact, um, this was a focal serrated change in a background of mildly active and quiescent IBD. So I wanted to mention to you that we can even tell serrated changes in some of these patients. And the actual prognosis of serrated changes in the IBD population is uh, a little bit in doubt, although there's some evidence to suggest these patients do have a higher risk of um, standard dysplasia in addition to that. So here's what, if just to remind you, what the serrated biopsy can look like. And look at how nicely that can line up with what you can see when you're doing careful exams like this. And in fact, that was what this was, and the patient underwent additional evaluation. Now, there are pit patterns described for serrated lesions um, that look kind of like fireworks going off around dysplasia. Uh, the star pattern um, that we're used to seeing and sometimes think of as hyperplasia in the distal colon. But uh, identifying this and knowing what it is when you're going through these exams is also very important. This was described in our, the Red Journal in 2012. Here's a 50-year-old female with ulcerative pan colitis for 30 years, referred after surveillance, um, and she had active inflammation and high-grade dysplasia by outside review. And when we got to her cecum, there was that adherent mucus I made mention of earlier. And in fact, it was a sessile serrated lesion, and our review of her outside path was not high-grade dysplasia. So again, emphasizing the need for expert path review as well as your careful review when you're dealing with some of these types of lesions. So I hope that uh, that's been instructive for you. For those who haven't done chromo before, uh, like anything in medicine, there's a lot of pattern recognition here and comfort, but we haven't really done such a good job yet in defining a learning curve or competency or quality for these exams. So uh, my recommendation is you should certainly, if you haven't done it before, you can dip your foot in the water here, um, but stay tuned for some additional guidance as we try to work through this as a field. I think that uh, studying the high def scopes um, and understanding some of our new technology and doing larger evaluations to look at outcomes is important. Uh, so choose your patient, choose your dye, learn the technique, prep your patient properly, learn the pit patterns, and hopefully I've gotten you on the road to doing that today. And remember, for the difficult patient, the difficult colon, and the difficult lesions, don't forget to get your surgeons involved early and have them talk to the patient too, because we don't want to be following somebody who really would have been much better off going to surgery. And I'll end with um, one more slide, maybe? Can you guys advance for me? Or is that the last one? I guess that was the last one. Okay, well, good. Thank you very much.